back to Truck Tech. One of the best things about following major events in the trucking technology space in person is the opportunity to hear from leaders who make it happen. On today's show, we'll reach into the not so way back machine from my September trip to Germany and hear from two such leaders. First up is Matthias Jerko, who's the CEO of Cellcentric. That's the fuel cell joint venture between Daimler Truck and the Volvo Group. And like a proud new father, Matthias revel reveled in the success of the 650 mile trip that the Mercedes-Benz Gen H2 completed in Berlin after leaving Worth just a day earlier. My guest is Utias Uriko. Uh, he is the CEO of Cellcentric, which is the joint venture fuel cell stack maker for Daimler Truck and for Volvo uh, Group. This is a joint venture that was built, uh, created about three years ago and uh, recently just completed its first run on the Daimler Truck of 1,047 kilometers, roughly 600 and some miles, on a single tank of liquid hydrogen. Matthias, that's got to be a big one for you. And of course, we're, we're speaking a after the fact, but that had to be uh, quite an event even for you to be part of. Alan, it was really so emotional to see this truck driving around the corner. And um, I mean, it is something, it's gigantic. And, and I must say, I feel so proud and filled with pride. Uh, for 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 our people who have developed this jointly uh, in the last in the last years and um, towards on cell centric if I may uh, I mean we are a joint venture with the 30 years of um, of experience and now to see this truck in its unique application now driving around and there was a comparison made of a baby and this baby is not only making one step after the next yeah it has already walked with this on a pre-serious aggregate a marathon. And that's so super, and this is so emotional. It's really, some, it's, it's breathtaking. Well, just weeks ago, I had an opportunity in Sweden to, to ride in your other product, the other, uh, it was the very first one, it was at the 100, kilo, uh, the 100 kilowatt uh, power plant that, that Volvo has. Uh, clearly, these projects are developing at slightly different speeds but they're both planning to have product in the latter part of the decade. That's what you've said all along. Uh, I think the question though really becomes, uh, and I've heard others say this, you know, it's not us. We could give you product sooner, but we need hydrogen and we need an infrastructure. Absolutely. I mean, there are a couple of preconditions. It's the product is ready. We have seen now today, there's technology readiness. And there's even that stage as well a serious readiness, even that we have to industrialize it now into big serious volumes. These big serious volumes, they have some preconditions. And the one precondition is to have green hydrogen, because this is what it's all about, to become net zero, emission free. And on the other hand side is the infrastructure, the availability of the hydrogen at all of the points of demand. And this is something which, um, which we see currently needs their further support, whether it's from politics, politicians, and as well from uh, the entrepreneurial side to make this happen. We have a number of things happening in the, in the fuel cell space I'd like to cover in the few minutes that we have. One is uh, you are still doing sort of a twin uh, fuel cell, uh, I don't want to call it lashed together, but they, they operate together, so that means uh, separate balance of plant and things like that, correct? I mean, you know, it's Yes. And, and what I'm wondering is, we, we know of one company, uh, Hyzon, that is doing a 200 kilowatt single unit. Do you think that's the direction this goes eventually into sort of a single unit? So you obviously cut down on some of the redundancy in, in, uh, in parts and imbalance of plant, things like that. I mean, I must say this current principle of uh, connecting 250 kilowatt with the 300 kilowatt in total being then available for all of the applications and requirements where these trucks are in is a sweet spot. So at the end of the day, one will see and we are following as well what's happening on the market. We're doing as well benchmarks end and end. But I think what is important that we have today a reliable basis for trucking that we show the world and uh, economies that we are able to produce something which is then serious, not only serious ready, as well producible in a big and high volume. And then from there, we come then definitely into next development stages and we will um, 
observe this very, very carefully in which direction this goes. First, let's get one out there and show that it's reliable exactly. and then we'll talk about the future. Exactly. This is, this is this, I would always say, this is swiveling and thinking. Yeah? Yeah. Finish that line yeah? and get ready so that's not that far away to reach then the target so, and then think about the next. Got it. So let's talk for just a moment about uh, some other possibilities for Shellcentric. Obviously, you know, we're following and very interested in what's happening on mobility and mobility side. What about stationary uh, fuel cells? Is that something that is coming soon? Is it something that sort of helps pay the bills? How do you, how do you regard those? I mean, what we see stationary, we have a partnership together with Rolls-Royce Power Systems on stationary applications, especially there. It comes to backup power solutions, but they in, in the big um, uh, applications in the more than 10 megawatt area and so forth. Um, we, see, we see the opportunities for a stationary business uh, as well, uh, but I must really say for power generation, the 724 uh, hours mode, their a proton exchange membrane fuel cell as it is ours is by our opinion not that developed uh, so far so there you go rather than for solid oxide fuel cell systems when it comes to 724 hours you are able to to do short stacks and i know that's the term we use in america for pancakes but you know you can be <laughs> Short stacks for, for fuel cells, so you wouldn't necessarily have to have a, a fully built up, you know, full yeah. stack necessarily. Uh, is that mm -hmm. something that's being considered as well? Um, to fiddle around with the stacks and the size of the stacks and so forth. Um, this is all okay, but this, this you can do, you know, when you talk about um, their 20 and their 30 and their 100, but you know, we talk thousands, yeah. And uh, what it needs, uh, as soon as you start there around, uh, to, to, to change then the, the sides for short stack you know, and, 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 and big stacks. You must be able, you must have um, a right operating balance of plant. It starts with the humidifier and it ends as well with the electro turbo charges and all of the valves and, 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 and they must together work on a solid uh, software uh, environment. And so therefore there you can't change that much around and so therefore we are sticking to one system. If you come tomorrow to me and say, I have this application, we do not change then our fuel cell system. Yeah. You're going to get the 150 kilowatt. You can put three <coughs> together. You could be even more together yeah, to come into the megawatt. Yeah, but it will be always the same system. And not only for that it functions, right? It delivers uh, its uh, required um, uh, performance as well from our cost side. We want to reduce complexity, and I think this is the benefit of the our customers. And, and I could call you a modern day Henry Ford, you know, because he said you can have any color you want as long as it's black. As, as long as long it's a 150 kilowatt system, this is you it at this it. point in time. You can have and it. And if yeah. you don't want it, you don't want that, go somewhere else. Okay, very good. I remember you told me that, and you were quite passionate about it when we met a year ago at the Absolutely, yeah, and this hadn't changed. Yeah. Well, so you're consistent in, in your message. Yeah, yeah. Let me ask you about other potential future partners, you know, a joint venture uh, obviously has its parents and you do yours w would you see other opportunities out there for others that might be interested in uh, well 150 kilowatts to, uh, uh, is the number right uh, uh, for customers or potential other partners anything like that I mean we talk we are open as well for other customers and you know, parents decide at the end of the day who's going to join you in your living room. Right. And this is basically their talk, their call, yeah, and not ours. You know, we deliver our product and we will do this for anybody else whom they're going to think they should join. And we, I'm, I'm, I'm not aware of that on one hand side, and, but uh, I think one message I must be, I must want, I want to, to make this very clear. We are open for further customers, for other customers as well for other applications yeah? and it's not only the truck uh, to mention the one which is quite a similar application is for example the coach the long haul or the long uh, uh, range uh, coaches which uh, sees as well by my opinion um, uh, propulsion via a fuel cell system as a very good solution who do you like, uh, and maybe not like isn't the right word, but who do you see as sort of the major competitors for South Centric? And I'll give you a couple of thoughts. 
One is Toyota, you know, they're in the US now, they're building heavy duty fuel cells uh, and they're going to uh, sell to, to the Packard group, uh, you know, beginning in, I think, 2025. Uh, we have uh, very recently, of course, we've got the startup Nikola bringing the fuel cells out. We have Hyzon, which I mentioned earlier, uh, and there's others, you know, and they, see, they seem to come. Do, is, the question that always comes up is, is there room for everybody and is it something that, you know, the more the merrier because that advances the whole idea of fuel cells? Let me answer your question to get ready to circle around that. The biggest, let's say, contribution to this what fuel cell means is um, that we reduce cost and cost has something to do with uh, scaling. Mm. And with the two largest truck manufacturers of this world being the owners of the cell centric, um, then there is basically the scale effect directly given in the, in the, in the, in the, in the birth plate. Yeah. And so this helps us to bring down and reduce cost um, uh, to the point where then it becomes then viable to our and for our customers. It has not, not, not only in the production of the fuel cell, as well when it comes in, uh, in our uh, negotiations uh, with our suppliers. And at the end, a lot of what we do currently is we do it the first time. And we bring it the first time from the number one to the 10, to the 100 and to the thousands. And what it needs there to focus this together with your suppliers, because very often we develop our suppliers as well in the right um, uh, direction. What we see, the, what we see is that the one in the other, we say market participants, yeah, tries to use same suppliers as we do, so they follow us then on, on that on, on that route. We notice this and we see this, and um, for us it's the the biggest challenge to be always five steps ahead. This is the target what we have. And so therefore we, this is the reason why we say we are a startup and we are always in the running mode, always being a step ahead. And also the big dog in the porch of something that used to say about Chevrolet. Yeah, yeah. Eight years ago is that, you know, everybody has to, you know, if they have to come in behind you to get the supply, then they're probably going to pay a little more for it too. Uh, even though, you know, you may have brought the cost down overall. Yeah, but you know, our, our fuel cell is, you know, there's around more than 750 patents, yeah. And uh, so we're talking about this, there's a lot of uh, this fuel cell uh, around um, uh, secured on one hand side. And just to give you one little insight, or no, it's, it's basically something which is uh, here in Germany. We are regarded as um, the innovative, the most innovative um, uh, small and mid-sized company in the energy sector. Mm -hmm. We received this out of 500, and out of 500 in total, we made uh, place 18. It was the very, very. It was the first election, and we basically made it uh, uh, in the in the first 50s, and being the most innovative in the energy sector. So therefore, I mean, there you can see there's the speed, there's the focus, there's the passion, there's the commitment, and this is this how this company runs, and so proud of it, and I'm really honored to be part of it. We also had an opportunity to spend some time with Andreas Gorbach, the head of Daimler Trucks Technology Group. Andreas drove the literal final mile of the Gen H2 journey. We talked about that and other areas he leads as Daimler's top technology executive. I'm here with Andreas Gorbach. He is the head of technology, which really takes it a lot more than just technology, just the CTO role for Daimler Truck. He's got everything that leads up to it and everything you buy and everything you put into it pretty much. Isn't that correct? That's a little bit of the story, yes, <laughs> but it's, it's basically about technology. Yeah, well, that's good. That's what we're here about because this is a truck tech show. So I'm excited to have you. It's great to see you. I know that, uh, you know, we're, for our purposes, uh, what, what you did recently with uh, driving that uh, Gen H2 truck in here, the last couple of miles, I guess, or kilometers, and then actually have the, the, the tough task of getting it through that small gate. That was impressive, by the way. 
That was exciting. Yeah, yeah, I'll bet. I'll bet. Yeah. There's not that many of those people, trucks out there. People weren't scared that a truck would make a thousand kilometers. They were scared that I damaged something here <laughs> while driving in. <laughs> and you didn't, which is really good. This is why we're talking to you, because if you'd done that, yeah. you probably wouldn't have talked no. to me. No. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, it's great to have you. You know, we have uh, we had a chance to talk recently at the Capital Market Day in Boston a little bit, and I got to hear your presentations there. I think, I think you've got so much on your plate. We'll never cover it in you know, 22 minutes or what we have here, but there are certain things I, I, I do want to talk about. I want to start with some of your thoughts around uh, fuel cell and hydrogen because you're not going to have the one, or you maybe you will have the one without the other, but really what you have is a collection of paperweights if you don't have the hydrogen to fuel them. Why don't we start there? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's a good one to start with. And, and you are right, just the product, just the truck is not going to be sufficient uh, to decarbonize transportation. Uh, you know we follow a dual track strategy based on both battery electric and hydrogen propelled trucks. Everybody has its sweet spot for the customer. But both require two more ingredients that go beyond the product, which is the truck, and we will deliver the truck. And the first ingredient is infrastructure. So for battery that's charging stations and for hydrogen that's hydrogen refueling stations. And second, um, it needs to be a viable business case for our customer. And in our B2B business, obviously the customers don't buy the truck because they want to, they buy, it. they buy it because they must to fulfill their transportation task. And it needs to be from an economical standpoint, at least on high level with diesel, or even better, uh, such that we get a real pull from the market. So these are the two ingredients that we need beyond the product, infrastructure and basically um, an economic viability for the customer. Economic viability, I mean, I've heard you say that uh, at the end of the day, uh, you're not going to have this at exactly what you're paying for diesel, but we're going to replicate the, the fueling structure and, and the things that you're used to on a zero emissions basis. That's where we're going, and we're going to go there whether you want to come or not. You're coming. You just said that. So I guess the, the question is, how do you get that value chain to the point where it, it comes down to some level, you said on some level, you got total cost of ownership parity now, but very limited examples. Uh, how do we expand those? Have you got that figured out yet? <laughs> I think we have to create lighthouses. We have to create lighthouses that means we have selected customers that get our product. We have players who invest in the infrastructure that the customer needs, and we have players who provide hydrogen towards this infrastructure. And then the customers will start realizing the benefits and otherwise others will look at it and say hey this is how it works and we can copy and scale from there but again as long as the price of co2 is not baked into diesel it, it, it's going to be hard to beat diesel as for the economic viability and this is it, why it requires all players involved us as the manufacturers the infrastructure player the energy provider but also the right political framework to make this happen. The framework, the political framework, is the one that could uh, effectively raise the cost of diesel, right? Because that's kind of maybe one of the only solutions, really, is to charge for carbon or, or, or whatever, you know, uh, and, and certainly we see that in California, yes. you, know, where, where, yes. uh, you know, where we operate. But I, I, guess, I guess I'm really wondering, in, in your case, you know, you've got the product, you're probably, are you a little ahead of things right now, of where you're expected to be, especially having recently completed this you know, thousand uh, kilometers, excuse me, thousand and forty seven kilometers yeah. run. Right. And there was some hydrogen left in the tank. There you go. See? Well you had to back out to the gate. We didn't want you to do that. <laughs> uh, what what, uh, what what would you what would you see in terms of something, you know, here in again we're in we're in Berlin and see government, but uh, you know, would you see the, the government supporting something to sort of balance those scales a little bit? Because that's kind of what you're talking about, right? Yes, absolutely. Uh, we see that starting to happen, either with subsidies on the one side for the new technologies, okay, you don't want to subsidize this forever, or um, by increasing, or let's say by putting the CO2 price tag on diesel. The, the European answer to this is to toll, the toll system, mm -hmm. where the difference that you pay per mile between diesel and zero emissions starts increasing and increasing and increasing. And by that, this is a very good instrument to, to shift the economic optimum towards zero emission technology. So yes, we do get support from the political framework. Enough? Not yet, I'd say. So you're right, we are a little bit ahead of the pack 
I don't think that the product will be the bottleneck for the decarbonization. The products will be ready. Let's talk for just a minute about my market because you're responsible for that too, really, in, in, the, in the main. And, and that there was talk about uh, doing a, a fuel cell project uh, with Cummins, so with Freightliner. Um, but you also, I think, the intent is to ultimately have the cell centric uh, truck, the joint venture product, this fuel cell stack in, in North America. Uh, do you still see that as sort of the, the, the progression, if you will, of, of how that plays out? Yeah, absolutely. It's the right approach to work um, for the small series for the first trucks together with Cummins in North America. Um, as cell centric has to focus on getting the series production run in Germany. As soon as the market develops in the US, we will see the cell centric product there as well. And we've designed the the cell centric platform in a way that it fits in all brands of the Daimler truck family. So we can use it in North America like we can use it in Latin America or Asia. Would it be an imported product? Would the would the, the, the fuel cell stack be imported? Uh, initially I'm sure, but Eventually, would you, I mean, if there was a market to develop for hydrogen absolutely. in a meaningful way, would you build them? Yeah, okay. Absolutely, absolutely. Like you said, small volumes, so it's, we're going to start with exporting from here and importing from the US standpoint, but if there's a big market, we will localize. Right. The, the, um, uh, the whole idea of self-centric made a great deal of sense. You, you had years and years of, of uh, especially passenger vehicle work in fuel cells, you know, before this. And ultimately, I've heard, you know, Martin uh, Dong say, you know, we really didn't need a partner for this. You know, this is not, this is not cheap. We should not be doing that on ourselves. What about other future partners for that kind of work? I mean, partnership, uh, I heard another company say recently, is the new leadership. Do you subscribe to that? Absolutely. I mean, we're facing the biggest challenge this industry has ever seen with decarbonization and digitalization at the same time. And we already had enough challenges before these two streams came. But to master this, it requires partnerships, absolutely. And it requires platforms that we can roll out. So develop once, deploy many times. We call that commonality for the Dynamo journey. Mm -hmm. But that's not sufficient. We, we need to share the invest and increase scale with partners. That's true for fuel cells as it is true for battery cells. Right. I want, to, I want to switch over a little bit to uh, the end of life, and I want to talk about both batteries and I want to talk about fuel cells too, but, you know, we're hearing a lot about circularity these days, about, you know, the, the end state of batteries especially, and if you've got a lot of energy left in those, in those batteries, uh, you know, there's recycling, there's repurposing, there's remanufacturing. I presume all of those are in the same. Can you kind of walk us through your thinking on that? On the fuel cell side? Well, the, you can start with battery, and then we'll talk about fuel cell, I mean, you know. Yeah, with battery, like you said, I think uh, if, the, if the truck reaches end of life, um, the battery is not necessarily at the end of life. So we're going to see reuse in secondary applications, for example, stationary power. Uh, obviously, we'll, we will also uh, look into recycling and remanufacturing. Um, and obviously, we're going to have reuse in the, in, the, in the new product that we built. Uh, um, so we're, we're looking at all these dimensions, and I think it's inevitable uh, to, in the, in the target picture, basically recycle 90-95% of all the batteries. And, and, um, what would be a big number for input on a, on a new product of, of recycled material? Like 20%, 30%? Uh, is there a number that you would like to see in terms of the reuse? You know, complete in a circle, if you will. You say, you know, you use... Why not 90%? Absolutely, in the time yeah. which I mean, it's going to be difficult because there's not so much used material available, right? The, the battery market grows faster uh, than we can get used material in our hands to, for the use. But in the target picture, 20, 30 years from now, why not 90%? It's okay. possible. I'll come back to you on that. Yeah, yeah, the same holds true for full fuel cell, by the way. Yeah, well, of course, in fuel cell, you've got some precious metals involved, yes. obviously. Yeah. And, you know, the, they're always worth harvesting. I mean, you know, I don't know how much platinum, palladium, and things like that you're using, yeah, that's, but that's the kind of stuff that's in there. I think we can recycle basically everything like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I guess I also am very curious from a you know the the digitalization where we're seeing so much now, but you know everything is AI, generative AI, and things like that. Uh, talk me, talk to us a little bit, if you would, about sort of the main focuses in that digital realm. You, you spoke to this capital market day. Uh, Maybe you could kind of a short short course. <laughs> yeah, I think 
one aspect is the software we put on a truck. And that will play a more and more important role as we move forward. Maybe some people say software is going to be the number one differentiator in the future, in the 30s. We push more and more complexity into the software, more and more features into software, and that enables us to have faster development cycles and, and flash new features over the year. So we're basically transforming the truck into a programmable device. But that's not only for us. That also opens the door for our customers and third-party players to push their respective applications on the truck. Um, I, I guess I also, um, you know, would would be interested in knowing just your take on where we're going from a a general technology perspective. Now, you you don't buy cell phones on wheels. I just heard that. But are we more technologically focused overall to the point where? Obviously, it helps the drivers when we can uh, do steering that you know requires very little effort, things like that, and you know these the driver enhancement features. Really, this is all really technology based, isn't it? It's all. It is. I, mean, and I think technology will play more and more a crucial role to decarbonize, to digitalize, to optimize the 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 TCO for the customer, and, and to differentiate against the competition. Yeah, very good. Yeah, I, I guess, uh, Andreas, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just wondering at this point, you have so much in your plate, really, and we didn't go through all of your roles. How do you balance that? How does your day balance out? You know, I, I'd say it doesn't balance out at all. <laughs> but it, the question is what balance is for you. And, and if, if balance is the number of hours you work and don't work, then it doesn't balance out. But if balance mean, means uh, that it's a privilege to be part of this insanity, to be part of that biggest challenge that this industry has ever seen, hey, then it balances out a lot. Yeah? And then all of a sudden, your job is a calling. It's, it's a privilege to be part during that times where we have the opportunity to shape so much with technology. And if you, if you see that as a privilege, then you get more energy back than you invest. And then. You can hear it in your voice. You heard it, you heard it come up, you know, yeah. with, with, with what, what you did recently, you know, with your nice charming job. And then, you know, you're here uh, right now. Is that it's, it's, it's something we're getting up for in the morning. Yes, absolutely. Every day. Very good. All right. Well, thank you, Andres, very, very much. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Yeah, thank you. Well, we hope you enjoyed hearing from two of the industry leaders in hydrogen fuel cells. This episode of Truck Tech and the 40 or so other shows from this year are available for your viewing anytime on the FreightWaves YouTube channel. Just click on Shows, then Truck Tech, and you'll have full access to a playlist. On Fridays, we post the companion Truck Tech newsletter to the FreightWaves website, and we email it to more than 11,000 subscribers. You can join that group on the FreightWaves homepage uh, under Newsletters. This week, Daniel Barrel, the head of Re Automotive, talks about how his Israeli-based business is feeling the effects of the Hamas-Israel war with his employees and their families called to serve in the war effort. And he provides an update on the growing number of firm orders that Re is receiving for its unique electrification technology. Hope you'll tune in for that. And thanks for watching. We'll see you next week.